Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. My name is Azam Masood. I am the project coordinator at the Florida Institute for Health Innovation. It is my pleasure to co-host the Oral Health Needs Index walkthrough with our esteemed panelists, Dr. Cherry Houston, Dr. Wansu M, Dr. Charlotte Baker, and Ankit Sanghavi. You guys introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Cherry Houston. We're so happy to have you uh, present with us today on this Oral Health Needs Index uh, webinar, Transforming Data to Improve Oral Health. Um, our speakers uh, for today is um, Dr. Wansu M, who is the Associate Professor of Family and Community Medicine at Meharry Medical College and Director of the National Community Mapping Institute there. Um, also speaking this afternoon is uh, Dr. Ankit Sanghavi, Executive Director of the Texas Health Institute, who is also a member of the Oral Health Needs Index team. Responding to the presentation will be uh, Dr. Charlotte Baker, who is Assistant Professor of Population Health Sciences, Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Baker was um, formerly at FAMU during the pilot phase of this project. Our host, as he just introduced himself, is uh, Ansu Musad from the Florida Institute for Health Innovation, along with the Florida Oral Health Alliance, who helped us put together all of the, the pilots and the trainings during our time in Florida last year. So we're gonna move right into the presentation as it's a, a full couple of hours, and we want to leave time in the end for um, discussion. And then after Dr. Ankit will come Dr. Baker, and then uh, Ankit will come back and lead us in the discussion and the Q&A portion of this presentation. So Dr. M, the floor is yours. Uh, actually, as the uh, Ankit, uh, the uh, to do the oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we did change that. Um, Ankit is going to go first and then lay out for us about the uh, Oral Health Needs Index Project and uh, talk about that and why we chose Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Houston, and thank you, Dr. Rim. Uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. This is Ankit Sangui. Um, and before I, I get into my, my part of the presentation, I want to make sure everyone can hear me clearly. So if, if you are unable to clear, uh, please leave, um, since everyone is in the listening only mode, please use the chat box option on your uh, right side of your screen uh, so that uh, Azam or any one of the panelists can see your message and we may be able to fix things if there is any issues in, in hearing the audio. Um, so uh, again, I am the executive director for the Texas Health Institute. Um, I've been in this role for um, almost a year now. But I've been with the Institute for four years and started the oral health program that I continue to lead it in the transition. Uh, and one of the key projects that we had been involved in uh, since uh, the last few years of our work in oral health has been the oral health needs index. The idea behind this project is really um, there is a need much out there in the in the oral health community with the understanding that uh, oral health is not just an issue of the oral cavity and it's uh, an issue from a health equity or health disparity standpoint, and the role the larger social determinants of health play in impacting uh, oral health. And our understanding as we started this work, and Dr. Uh, Sherry Houston has, has led this project since its inception, is uh, utilizing data, technology, and engaging the community in a way that we are not only able to increase the availability and, and access to uh, meaningful oral health data, but to be able to design and design a, provide a toolet in a way that we are able to better establish the relationship and the connection between oral health and the social determinants of health. And such that this tool can be used in an effective way for a program development, policy evaluation, uh, funding, increasing access to services, and, and it goes on. However, this is not something for several of us uh, who are attending the webinar today. Uh, in the public health world, uh, there has been an influx of resources as far as access to 
data is concerned and tying resources to health equity and social determinants of health. So we wanted to make sure that we were not reinventing the wheel or we were not replicating efforts. Um, so before we dive into the, the demonstration today of what the OHNI tool is, what does it offer for you and what are our plans as we scale things up from here on? As Dr. Houston said that we have been in the pilot phase um, for the last year and a half of this work, which has been a foundational step for us in the way we are planning to scale this tool to be launched at the national level and be the resource for oral health advocates, but also advocates and champions working towards health equity and larger public health goals. So uh, before we start with the presentation on the tool, I want to highlight some of those things that what makes this tool unique, um, as well as uh, is a value add than the other resources that are out there, um, like, like such as, for example, co county health rankings or community commons are a couple of uh, tools that come to mind as we think about community health data and resources to help with that. So what makes it unique is our focus on oral health and establishing the connection to social determinants of health. Uh, that's really the objective behind this whole initiative and what guides us forward. Uh, there is a lot of data around public health, community health, but with very little emphasis on oral health. And our primary objective was to identify what are those data elements that are out there and how can we bring it up to uh, uh, a platform where it, they are available for all stakeholders to access in a meaningful way. But on the other hand, what guides our framework is also the, the health equity lens. So we wanted to share uh, or leverage the other community health and social health data that's available out there to merge it with oral health and to be able to tell a story. The other piece of our work, what sets us different or unique is the design. And the emphasis is not just on the data, but the way data is presented, the way data is socialized, and it can be utilized for um, for meaningful conversations, again, going back to policy development, program development, evaluation, and so on. And the, and lastly, but the most importantly, is, is the emphasis on creating value for the end user. So how can we utilize this tool that gives enough flexibility, but also resources for the end user and our stakeholder that each one of you is joining us uh, for the presentation today to be able to utilize this technology and the tool that we have access to and that we have been able to create to leverage this with the data that you are collecting and how can we how can you utilize this tool to uh, utilize that data and to be able to create a story or a resource within your community or the settings that you and we work in um, so that those are the three elements that sets us unique um, can we move to the next slide please and uh, it's also important, as I said, that it's been a journey so far, and uh, we are we have been in a foundational setting with a pilot phase where we are testing the the design, the value, and the efficacy of this tool, uh, and we have we have had some great feedback uh, from our stakeholders and partners in Florida since that's what we selected as our pilot state uh, for a, a several different reasons, going from data availability to an active stakeholder group uh, that could provide feedback but also having strong partnerships to be able to engage the community, not from an evaluation standpoint, but utilizing this evaluation as a platform to develop the, the national tool and then moving towards the national launch. So Florida was identified as our pilot state and uh, the tool is currently in, is growing out of the pilot phase to learn the lessons, incorporate some of the changes that we have made since the feedback that we have received and preparing for a much national launch. Um, the, uh, the user feedback piece has been integral to the journey so far, and uh, this webinar is another opportunity to hear from our users on what is it that we are missing uh, that may be out there and what is it that we do need to add. So uh, please continue to share ideas. I'm looking forward to the Q&A part of the discussion to hear from you on what you think about the tool and where there can be some opportunities. Um, but uh, that, that's, that's part of our process and where we are right now. We are also identifying uh, new avenues of uh, identifying data that is more granular, that is not just at the state and national level, but how can we get more more granular with more county or zip code level data. Uh, we have identified a few resources uh, since the pilot launch as well, and those are being uploaded or uh, being 
looked at in terms of how can that be integrated for all states uh, through the OHNI platform. Uh, but we are, uh, I know we still have a lot of other resources that are out there we need to look at. So again, ideas and feedback that you have are well appreciated and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be looking at it in terms of how can we integrate that into R2. And then lastly, uh, the emphasis on this tool is really being designed for community engagement and empowering our communities to utilize their individual data, merge it with data that's available, available out there from up, other public data sources um, to be able to uh, utilize this for larger systems change efforts, both at the local level, but also at the state and national level. Uh, with that being said, I think so we are all set and uh, I am really looking forward to Dr. M's part of the presentation, uh, which will get some insights and illustrations of what are those um, elements of our tool how can we utilize it and what kind of data have we been uh, already been explored with? So, Dr. M, it's all yours. Hi, uh, thank you, Anke. Uh, so, the website address is actually oralhealthindex.org. So, you can actually try that exactly, you know, the way that I show on the website. And also, it can be accessed by using your smartphone too. So, uh, so far, even we didn't really advertise, uh, we have about the 33,800, actually as of today, 872 visit for the website. And uh, so I just want to show you some of the map that, you know, a lot of people are aware that there's not like the, many of the oral health related data available, but these are the example of the, some of the map that we create by uh, using breakfast data, uh, behavioral risk factor, like the data that was surveyed at the county level. So this one shows the percent and the permanent teeth has been removed because of tooth decay or gum disease. It's an average of 2006, 2008, and 2010. So you can see certain patterns. So MAP is really a powerful tool to see, you know, where are uh, issues and then, you know, and then how you can like kind of understand and you can overlay with other variable too. And this one shows the percent of respondent that two teeth clean by a dentist or a dental hygienist within the past year. So if I go back to the another map, you can see they are kind of they have like inverse relationship too. And like next map shows a percent of respondent, adult who have visited a dentist or dental hygienist or a dental clinic within the past year. So it shows like the similar kind of, you know, pattern. But again, uh, you know, this is a county level and then actually breakfast data, they don't really provide this kind of data anymore at the county level after 2011. So, like the, what we did was the, we are able to get the data from the Florida Department of Health and also some of the participants. So this, like what we are able to do is not just county level, we are able to map the number of dentists by zip code. So you can see the, where the, all the, like the dentists are located within Florida. But again, this is correlated with population density. So you cannot really see whether there are enough like dentists per population. So we create this map, and this map shows the, at the zip code level, how many dentists are there per thousand population. And then we actually did a focus group in Florida, and then we found out it doesn't really matter how many dentists are there per thousand population for the zip code. I mean, people need to have information how many dentists accept their insurance. And also, how long they have to be, you know, they have to wait, you know, to get an appointment. So, you know, these are the data that we have now, but we could enhance certain data to show, you know, the more, the quality, good quality of the data that assess the, you know, like the dentists available. And this is a map. Uh, we have a, like the four section, clinical care, socioeconomic, and, you know, some other data. So for example, this is the example of the clinical care, we got data from the Dr. Rosa Martin from Florida Department of Health, and she's a dental director. So she provided data after actually we had a focus group, and this one shows the ER visit, like emergency room visit per thousand 
you know, population. So you can see the, you know, how many people like visited like emergency room with a dental like reason. So the darker color means that there are more people visited with the dental like the, you know, issues for the emergency room. And then you can see for the like the age less than 21, you can even see that ACS conditions with ACS condition means the ambulatory care sensitive conditions, which means actually if there is a like a enough primary care, uh, you know, they don't need to come to the emergency room or they don't need to come to the, you know, like they admitted to the hospital. So like you can overlay with the dentist location, hospital location, dentist per thousand, but you can also look at this ER visit data. And then also there's an ER cost per visit, you know, how much does it cost, you know, for the dental or dental for the like the uh, under 21 and ACS conditions or diabetes related too. So you can see that there's a lot of data for the emergency room or hospital discharge and then ambulatory care center data. Uh, which Florida has, we can process those data and then, you know, and then create the statistic at the zip code level and then provide more like a local and the meaningful data. Uh, this is at, actually at the county level. And the, this is a dental care with the dental health professional shortage area, dentist rate and percent adult with no dental exam and so on. And this one shows the socioeconomic, socioeconomic and demographic data. So in addition to the clinical data, you can actually click the map. You can see population by age group, population by race, education, and income, and then whether they have insurance, like uninsured adult, and uninsured children, and other data too. And this one shows it like the behaviors. I mean, we have like cigarette consumptions. You know, where are the people that who smoke like most, we can even add some other data like the, you know, water quality, or whether the water like is being provided with the prorate and then some other data set too. And another one that we did, uh, this is like, for example, like physical environment, severe housing problem, food insecurity, and like some other data. And, but another one map that we create is the actually like at the location based level. So this one shows the dental resource directory. So we were able to map the all the dental office location in Florida and create the map. So if you click it, you can actually see last name, first name, middle name, and then all the detailed information. And then you can actually overlay with other data layer. And uh, this is the example of the dentist per thousand population, a dentist by zip code, well, you can actually overlay with other census data. You know, all the data that I show you, I get the clinical and the socioeconomic and some other data that can be overlaid with the actual dental office location. And you can click it. So this one is the dental ER visit per thousand population. So you can look at the list and you can create the chart. This is all online. I mean, again, if you visit the website, oralhealthindex.org site, you can try this by yourself. So if you, if I click this, for example, is the proportion of population in poverty, like at the census tract level. So we provide the data at the county level and zip code level and census tract level, which you can see more detail. So you can actually assess and you can view the data at the local level. And the, and like if you have a dentist, you can even create a heat map. So this like the shows, I mean, just because there is a dot that you cannot really assess how dense they are. So you can create the heat map and then, you know, you can see the concentration of the dentist and you can overlay with other data set. So like in, for example, in here, I did, I can do the search by last name, first name. We can even add the insurance data too. So I was looking for the last name Park, and you can you find that all the dentists that has the P A R K, and then it shows, and then you know, and then if you click it, it actually show on the map, right? But not just this. You can even see the list of the other doctors, and you can edit it, right? And then you can create the chart. Right? Or you can just generate the statistic. Or you can actually add a photo. This is actually a photo of myself. I just want to test it, you know, how. So in theory, 
each dentist location can have a user ID and password to the each unit dental office. They can upload the information. You know, they can upload their photo. They can upload what kind of insurance they take it, whether you know they are operating hours and office hours. And then you know, if they are on vacation or something, they can say office closed for a certain day. And consumers and then some other people can access those data right away. So this is one example. Like if I click edit, you know, you can edit the locations and last name, dentist, and office hours and all those. Then I can add a photo. Uh, and then you can add multiple photo, your office, like the, you know, the information or equipment and something like that too. The same information can be accessed by using smartphone. Like, uh, this is, I did a screenshot of this smartphone, nice oral health need index project. So they can use this one to find the information too. And then in, in like the many different ways, they can search it. So it's accessible by using uh, desktop and smartphone and as an app too. So I just showed you like the example of what we did in the Florida as a pilot project. But this is this one of the project after we did the Florida. You know, when we actually had a meeting uh, at the dental quest, like one of the meetings that they, you know, one the doctor wanted to map the data in like Pennsylvania. So we mapped the practice train in oral health in Pennsylvania. As you can see, we have a Tennessee dentist directory and Texas dentist directory with the same function and Georgia dentist directory. So what we are going to do is the, like the basically three things uh, in oral health need index. We try to actually collect the data that is available on the internet and, you know, and then, you know, NIH and like CDC and all those data, and then we try to create this kind of map. And then another one is, you know, we wanna, we are partnering with other organizations. They have data, right? And what we can do is we can either bring the data and then add it here, or we can actually make the online linkage and we can add the data. So we have our own database and we are partnering with other organization and add the data, but also the way that I show you in the Florida that doctors, how they actually collect data, we can provide this tool at the community level, at the local level, so they can even map the, you know, dental resources, like any, like even for example, like the healthy food store, or like something related with oral health. So this can be used at the community level and they can organize, they can update data. Those data can be feed into our oral health index project and then it can be shared with other people. So there's a three different level of the, you know, data sharing and the data dissemination. Okay, I'm done. Now, next presentation will be done, uh, actually the respondent by Dr. Charlotte Baker. All right, thank you, Dr. M. So one thing that um, this does and, and uh, for, Full, full de uh, declaration, I am an epidemiologist, so I absolutely love data. And I love the fact that we have this particular tool um, because as an epidemiologist and a public health practitioner, this particular type of tool lets anywhere from the individual level through the federal level, look at so many different aspects of oral health and where the particular needs are, where we're doing better. Um, particularly, we can think about through all the different maps we just saw, we can overlay different things from different points in time. We can look at information about where is your particular dentist office? What is it surrounded by? Where is it? Um, this helps us really make sure that people can see what the particular need is in their area. If I am in, for example, Duval County, which is where Jacksonville, Florida is, I may not be concerned with what's happening in Miami-Dade County down in the south part of the state, but I'm really concerned and I can use this tool to narrow in on my community and say, we have more dentists, so you know, what is our actual issue with access to care? We can then look at oh, they don't take the type of insurance that the majority of our residents have. Let us, as a, as a public health agency or as a university or a, a community organization, let us work with different people to get uh, dentists in our area to accept the need. Or we may live in a, in a 
desert of oral health care. Let us work to try to get more clinicians here. Let us work to try to get, you know, some intermediate pieces to happen over time so that our population is served. So this particular tool um, lets us say where we should really focus our energy and our efforts. As more uh, ha things happen in public health and we're having to do more with less um, in particular, then if we can really hone in on this and I'm not having to spend the time and the energy necessarily myself to get to some of these particular answers, even though we clearly see the data exist, then that means I'm better able to use my resources to actually improve the oral health needs of my community. So we can know where we should have more community programs, where we should have more health education, perhaps. So it may not be, you know, through this map we can see, perhaps it's not that there's not access. Perhaps it's that we just have no people going to the dentist. We can see from the information that um, was in one of the maps from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, we can see that people just don't go to the dentist. And we can see perhaps that they, you know, there's a level of indentialism that uh, can be avoided. And so perhaps we should go into those communities from a university standpoint or community organization standpoint and actually say to the community, we have these these things. Can you tell us more about why you're not going and, and work at it from that particular perspective? So I, I love the fact that many different people and organizations have the ability to take this in and use it how their training and their their needs exist. Um, as an epidemiologist, I may not be the person, of course, to provide dental services, but I am the person who can say, through these mapping, I can see that we have reduced the problem in our particular area. Or if I'm a health education person, I can see the impact that my health education program has had. And from that larger perspective, if I'm using grant funding, say, to increase um, oral health um, uh, services or community programs and that kind of thing, this is an excellent way to back up what it is that you're saying and what you're doing. Um, this means that you have even more resources at your disposal wherever you are to, to really get and harness what you need to get your work done. I think in particular, if we're thinking about all these different maps, people like pictures. And so if you're working out in the community and you can show them pictures of what's happening, it may also help you better get people to understand what is going on and, and what it is that they can do to better help themselves or what the government can do to better uh, better use their resources from a health department perspective to help their community. I think um, it also allows us to compare populations. Some of the, the maps that you saw from Dr. M show where we could look at things per 1,000 population. And in epidemiology, that means that I can look at the rate of, um, say, indentialism in one area of the state versus another, and that gives me that, that bit of evidence. But I've not had to spend the time myself. I like the flexibility of it. if I have data that I think would help this tool, I can put it into this tool. I, can, I have multiple avenues to get it where it is a part of this tool to help. And so that is also where we're talking about the dynamicness of the oral health needs index tool. Public health and health in general is not static. And so when we're able to have dynamic tools that let us see things differently, let us play with different pieces of information, it lets us say that we can we can have many people in real time seeing what's happening, where we are, how we're improving, what we need to do next. Um, do we need to have more food markets with healthier food? Do we need to have more dental clinics? Do we need to have also access to other clinicians because maybe we're having patients who have uh, diabetes or other issues that cause blood flow problems that then affect their dental and oral health? So I really like this particular tool. And when we did the focus group in Florida at Florida a and we really got into the discussions that you can vary your data sources and really vary the different data types that you're using so that everybody uses something different. But the partnerships are very important. You can have various agencies, such as health departments, which is where some of this data came from. You can have information from insurance. You can have information from community organizations or universities. You can also have all those different types of things. And so it's, it's continuing to be important to bring all those people to the table so that this tool continues to grow over the period of time.
And so that's that's my take on this. And I think that it's going to be fantastic for the future. Okay, our next, uh, you know, another presentation is the Ankit. Yes, sir. So, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rim and Dr. Baker for uh, for your for your presentation and uh, you know sharing uh, the inside board on what the the tool offers, but also you know how it can actually be applicable for some uh, systems change and uh, and solution based strategies uh, uh, at the community level. <clears throat> so let me kind of summarize this again. As I said, that uh, what has been central to our our growth story or success story so so far has been the the feedback and participation we have received from uh, our community stakeholders, and that is what has been able to supply us or I, help us identify uh, new data sources out there uh, that do exist but need a, a platform or a, a tool as such to be able to utilize it in an effective way while leveraging the other data that's out there. So for an overview, I would like to reemphasize um, the, the three elements or the strategies that we are using as part of the OHNI tool that is stands right now, but as we want to as we want to grow it as a much national resource for all stakeholders to use, is the emphasis on utilizing data that's already out there. Uh, the American Community Survey, the purpose data, the basic screening survey data that the state oral health surveillance systems are collecting, uh, uh, other data that are available from other national sources. Um, how can we utilize it? while being cognizant about the fact that not all of this data is unique. So how can we translate or make it unique as a value add? And that's the emphasis on the mapping uh, part of our story and the way we can help with data visualization and not just focusing on the numbers. So the second part of the element is how can we partner with organizations at the state and local level to be able to utilize data that's being collected, not necessarily as part of a much national framework, but that may be applicable or is applicable for change strategies and efforts at the community level. That's the second part. The third emphasis is really, which I think sir, is the biggest value, and, and I, I think Dr. Baker uh, explained a clear story of how do we create a value for others and users is to be able to utilize this tool for our data that we are collecting or data that we are most interested in and the flexibility that it offers to be able to not only include or uh, provide your data back to the tool, but also to be able to utilize the resources that it has in, in, in understanding what the implications that it has as part of a larger community-based framework. Um, it's the, it's the multifaceted approach that is, is, focusing on oral health, but also the social determinants of health that uh, that helps us tell the story or frame messages in a different way. As you may have noticed, uh, our emphasis today for today's part of the presentation was really looking at some of the access data points. So just looking at the data slides that Dr. M shared on the number of dentists available at the zip code level, um, also looking at the number of um, adults who have had a dental visit in the past year and then overlaying that data with uh, uninsurance rates or looking at data with smoking rates, we are able to tell a story that how access to oral health is being influenced or being impacted just because of the other factors that are out there in the community. Uh, even from a practice side, uh, if uh, outside of oral health, oral health or public health where it does have uh, uh, a value for end users is if, if there is a, uh, a community-based organization or if a dental practice is trying to set up a new location, they are able to actually map the community needs both from a de demand standpoint but also supply standpoint and to be able to use this in a way where, uh, where they can make some data-driven decision making. But at the same time, the ability to include your data. So if you were to start the work or if you were to have a community-based intervention, you can actually supply your data to this and see that change is happening and tell your story in a more effective way. Um, the community focus, uh, re-emphasizing what Dr. Baker said, is the flexibility and there is 
the tool will provide its true value when we start getting communities to utilize this tool by uh, supplying their data and utilizing the tool to visualize it, uh, what they provide. Um, as far as next steps is concerned, as I, as I shared in my earlier part of the presentation, we uh, have just finished the pilot phase of this work. Uh, we focused on Florida. Since then, we have also uh, convened or presented at several other uh, regional and national meetings and venues or stakeholders groups for their input from what we had heard from the community-based focus groups and uh, key informal interviews that we had in Florida. Uh, this part, uh, this time of the year in 2017, it was an exhaustive exercise. Our partners at the Florida Institute for Health Innovation uh, played a great role in helping us engage a diverse set of uh, stakeholders um, to help us with the evaluation and get their feedback. Uh, that has helped us make some changes already to the group. One of the examples that I can provide is uh, users wanted to not only get access to data and visualization, but also access to resources that are out there uh, to help with evidence-based strategy development. So what are some of those uh, evidence-based uh, resources or publications or toolkits that are out there that help not only uh, with the storytelling about oral health and how it's a health equity issue, but how can we address those in different community settings? So we have been able to add some of the resources and we are actually in the process of expanding that as a much more comprehensive resource and to be able to tie it in different ways. Um, the other step is that as we continue to go through this exercise, we have been making some uh, updates to our data governance uh, as well as data exploration pieces to not only keep the uh, data updates as an ongoing basis from the national data sources as they get updated, but also to be able to manage or somehow control uh, the way we are getting uh, local data or primary data from community partners and how can we help with the sense making or storytelling piece of it as part of looking at that individual data sets with much more larger publicly available data sets. So those are some of the elements. And then, uh, of course, our big push and goal is to, uh, to to scale things up to uh, work towards the national launch in the in the next uh, within the next one year so um, we are excited for where where things have been so far and and the input or interest that has been generated uh, again I want to re-emphasize the role that our community partners have played and uh, with that being said I do want to open this we wanted to keep this interactive to to be able to answer questions for any of the slides that we have presented today for what that data uh, tells us and stories that we can generate from that but also uh, you know what are those things that we are probably missing and how we may be able to answer some of those questions uh, on today's webinar uh, but also we can keep this as an ongoing conversation so i'll pause here uh, since the attendees are on a, um, a listening mode only i would ask the, the attendees to basically type your question in the chat window. Uh, myself and all of the panelists uh, on the uh, on this webinar will be able to see your questions and we'll answer the questions as we as we read them. And hopefully we may be able to cover because of the time that we have left, we will be able to cover most of the questions that the group may have for us. Thank you. While we're waiting on um, the questions to come in, uh, this is Cherry Houston. A few of the attendees have asked if the slide deck will be made available. Do you plan on sharing the slides in addition to offering a recording? I know we're offering the recording and I thought for sure most of the slides was on the website, but will they be together? I, I uh, can Dr. put a on the, our oral health index website for a link. Okay, thank you. So there will be a link on the Oral Health Needs Index website. One of the other questions that came in, it didn't come in on the chat line, but it came in in terms of um, how we were able to uh, utilize specific data relative to Florida, such as information on recent immigrants or how long immigrants had been in the state and how are they able to access dental services. Sorry about that. 
So I'm not sure if that's the question for Dr. M or if uh, that was one of the questions uh, that I came in through Dr. Baker. I didn't have, we didn't okay. have a about the immigration. I'm sorry, start that again, Dr. M. Yeah, we, I don't think we put the information about the immigration. But the, there is a, some data from the census, and so we can add the data, you know, if there is enough interest. So one of the things that we can do is the, I mean, if, you know, like the, among the audience, uh, if you either you have data or any suggestion, you can send us an email and then either we find it or any data, we can actually add that the, you know, variable on the map. And we had discussed a little bit of immigration data, um, particularly in the state of Florida, that's a very, very big thing, um, is we have a lot of um, immigrants from other places. We have a lot of populations that are even not necessarily English speaking um, in the state of Florida. And particularly, as you saw with some of the maps and other pieces, a lot of it is in English. Um, and so that is something we have discussed, um, as as uh, Dr. M and, and Ankit have said, is um, how to add those particular pieces, where that information would come from. And as they are saying, I just want to back up that it is flexible enough that as we have that, we can put it in, even if it's not at the entire state level. So for example, if we had information about Miami-Dade, we could put that information in for that particular place because we had it. Yeah, I mean, the, another thing is, if you're interested as a, like a linguistic, like you heard they speak Spanish and you know some other like the language, those data are available at the census track level from the census. Like, you know, they have so-called the what kind of language you speak, primary language you speak, whether they have difficulty speaking in English. We call it linguistic isolation. So I think it's a good comment. We can add those data layers uh, at the county level, zip code level, and then census track level too. Great. Uh, another question that came in um, was how are we making the interactive maps or this project accessible for the blind or for people with um, other issues that we typically don't think about? Uh, I guess I have to answer. I, I think uh, right now this project is focused on the oral health right now, and then we have limited like kind of funding, but you know, while the, we are capable to provide it, I think uh, you know, we, have, we have to set the like governance and some kind of policies, what kind of project that we can support at the local level. Well, I think more what they're meaning is how to how to make it maybe accessible for screen readers and that kinds of thing. So I think yeah. it is possible to do that. Um, I think we would have to look at the the funding mechanisms, but there are different mapping things available to make it accessible for screen readers or um, additional software. Yeah. Right. Oh. And someone mentioned. Um, and I'm not sure if it was relevant to that question, but it came up to check out the HRSA oral health strategic framework um, mm -hmm. or making interactive mapping accessible for the blind. So I think uh, Dr. Baker is correcting that they were referring to the software. Yeah. Okay. So, so Dr. Houston uh, and and the and the group again, great great presentation. We do have a, a series of questions from our attendees, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll be the moderator, and um, I'll, I'll we'll try to answer the questions that we have received so far. The, to first with, I will start. The first question is, will you share what states you are working with? Um, so uh, I'm happy to respond, but Dr. Houston and Dr. M, you may want to chime in uh, if I'm missing something. Uh, but so currently the, the pilot phase, uh, led us to focus just on Florida since we really wanted to uh, test the design and see what uh, what feedback we get from uh, our different stakeholders out there. Uh, since then, uh, to identify some new data sets that are available and to see if that availability is across the spectrum for all states, um, we are also identifying new data sets. And one of those uh, examples were uh, shared by Dr. Imhane's slide around the dental directories. Um, 
but that's something that we have done it for three states now and we'll be doing it for uh, every other state to see that if that data is available and then based on that we can develop a strategy of how that can be utilized with other state variables um, that's again part of our our work in developing this as a at, at the national level um, so so far uh, we are not proactively per se working with any state specific data set it's more of still exploration or identification of data resources that are out there and to be able to test it for replication in other states so that it can be become the part of our larger national framework again uh, dr houston and dr M, uh, do you have anything to add to this uh yes uh we uh, about the dental directory we have uh, like right now texas tennessee and georgia but uh, soon uh for this fiscal year we'll have a nationwide database at the county level you know certain data set that i show you at the you know behavioral risk factors and some census data you know so we have like a lot of relevant data so we'll try we'll have like the nationwide kind of database but the local level you know, some of the zip code level and the certain things depends on the, you know, whether what kind of data do we have. But at least if we try to create the one the kind of national map that you can see certain like oral health indicator at the county level. Yeah. Wonderful. Dr. Houston, do you have anything to add to this? Before no, I don't have any question? anything in addition. No. Great. So the next question that we have is uh, Oral Health Florida has a data action team that includes many from higher education. How should we go about connecting this team uh, to the initiative? Uh, again, Dr. Uh, Dr. Houston, do you want to answer uh, this question? I'm happy to, if you want me to. You can go ahead and answer that one. I'm not sure if they're separate from, I'm not familiar with this group. Uh, unless they are part so, of the uh, World Health 2020 network, yeah. Absolutely. So we have, a, a, to, for, for this specific question, as we as we uh, shared in our presentation, we reached out to a diverse group of stakeholders and, and there are several out there. So we would love to connect with them. I would encourage, um, if, if you have their contact information, uh, what we'll do in, in the follow-up when we send the webinar recording and the presentation, um, you actually have all of our contact information on the Oral Health Index website, but we'll also make sure that you receive uh, Dr. Houston's, Dr. M's, and my contact information um, with that email. So we would appreciate if you can just do a, a, a connection email. Uh, we would love to see how the, the data that we have on the, the website already is useful to them, but um, we may be able to even identify other data needs and resources and how we can help them uh, move towards their goal. So we would love it. And again, that's going to supply us with more important information on what our communities and groups looking for as we try to replicate this as a national work. So and, I and hope I, uh, answer, I would I would I would add to that um, that we welcome any um, new partners that's looking at data and uh, oral health. So. That, that's that's a welcome question. So yeah. thank you. So actually, Jay, if you think that you have some interesting data set that you know that can be you know like the good to like the you know print like print the map, you can just send to us, and then we'll try to kind of visualize, and then you know see how it can work you know within oral health need index project. And, and this is exactly what Dr. Rosa Martin did. She she sent us the data, and we incorporated. It, you know. And I think even outside of just sharing data, being able to, to have people locally who are very interested in oral health needs and oral health um, in general in their particular area are very able to help also help frame what these maps look like uh, for them and for their community. Um, for we really have been asking these questions, but we haven't made it put the pieces together or we're using it in this way. Um, how can we better make that accessible to other people? So the different ideas different people bring, I think, are very important um, for a combination of, of things. So definitely more more partners are able to help make better use of this map for everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, th thank you. Uh, to the group for adding on to this. And uh, yes, we would invite um, 
if you do have ideas for our resources and partners to connect with uh, where this can be helpful uh, we would love to we would love to make that work um, the next question and and as i'm as, as we are answering this question if you send one of the questions that we uh, we are responding to and uh, if you have a follow up to that please feel free to uh, add to the list and we'll make sure that we we do answer that um, but i'll move to the next question that we have on the list and it's about i'm curious about the development of the website why was florida chosen as a starting place and can you talk more about scaling over the next year um, again this is ankit and i i think so i did share in my initial part of the presentation uh, that florida was chosen as a pilot to uh, for three purposes as far as our development strategy for the tool is we wanted to pilot the tool with a state that had uh, data availability across uh, or beyond what what other public data that was already available out there which is like the purpose and the hrsa data sets and and so on we needed a state that had access to much more comprehensive statewide data when we were in the process of identifying a pilot phase back in 2015 uh, florida has, has has made some great strides in, in that domain so that was uh, the first reason or primary reason that we looked at it uh, and and the second which was more important from an evaluation standpoint is the presence of a strong stakeholder group and network within the state uh, uh, both at the state level but also at the community level and we were able to identify uh, a key partner in the again the florida institute for health innovation and through them several other partners uh, in the different regions of the state that were part of a local oral health coalition or a, a work group or a task force and so on um, and we looked at the presentation or representation of stakeholders and perspectives that were present on this groups uh, and that led us to having a, a strong um, evaluation group uh to to test the the again the the design of the tool the value that it is creating for stakeholders and uh, the type of content or the way it has been organized and how we can improve that before we move forward and the second part of your question was about how are we going about um, our strategy to scale this up nationally uh, is again i think we have responded to that in part over the for the first few questions that we just took is we are just at the the end of the pilot phase and now getting into data exploration data governance but also looking at a, a common set of indicators in addition to public data sources that are specific to oral health but are available for all states and and creating a framework uh, within which they'll fit as part of a national tool or resource and we as we said it our our goal is to have a, a national update or two within the next one year of this work and um we are we are working towards it but with ongoing feedback and and participation from our partners uh would be would be a key in ensuring that that we we meet that goal and for the purposes that we intend so again uh dr houston m and uh and dr baker i would i would welcome you to to chime in if uh, if there is anything to add no i i think you got covered it and and the only thing i would add is that in the beginning many years ago when we first started because most of us were located in the south southeastern region of the country and it had the greatest disparities uh in the nation it just made sense to start with the the regional health equity uh council region 4 states and florida was one of those and so other than that there that was the reason that florida was chosen any other inputs from the group no i think that covers it right so uh, i'll move to the next question and dr m i think this question is directed for you uh, so uh, how can local communities use the mapping tools at the local level to map assets and update it locally uh there is a lot of the you know functions like available similar like the even the, the you know EPA like the EJ view like environmental justice like the mapping tool that you can actually the map I mean we our uh, oral health index the mapping has capability too but uh you know so if you can request what you are going to do we can kind of review but we are not at the capacity to handle all the requests 
right now. So, you know, technology-wise, we can handle it. But, you know, about the capacity-wise, you know, I just uh, want to be careful that we'll handle everything. So I don't know whether, like, my answer was correct, I mean, you know, enough. Hello? Yes, I, I so, uh, so Dr. Houston, uh, this is Ankit again. I, I think it does, and, and the second part of this question or, or the other way of looking at it is I, do, I, I also think is, is, is some illustrations on how can local communities use uh, once they have some data or the map assets that are available through this tool. And I want to go back to Dr. Baker's slide and, and kind of just reemphasize the, the comments she made on how can, um, how can we utilize this tool, not just within the oral health setting, but as she gave her own example as an epidemiologist, if she were to be applying for a grant uh, to increase access to oral health services, uh, how can we use this tool for planning that grant uh, from a need standpoint, uh, assessing the needs in the community? But if we do have a resource, then how can we uh, incorporate or supply the data in this tool and to be able to show the change? That how is it changing the dynamics uh, within the community? And you know, the, some some examples using the heat map or also the zip code level analysis and overlaying that with uh, larger. Uh, social determinants of health or demographic measures can help us tell uh, a story over a period of time. Dr. Baker, do you do you do you have any 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 additional comments to that? No, I just I want to back that part up in terms of you can zoom in this very same way, for example, you would with an Apple map or a Google map or something like that. Um, you can zoom into it to what your local area is and and some of it really depends on what data is available um, as far you know nitty-gritty as you can get um, some of the data we had was available at the county level um, some data may be available at the zip code level and, and if that's the case then definitely let's work with some some local communities to try to get that information into this but you can zoom in or out as as far as you need to so as a local community definitely if you are not getting down as far as you want to be able to get, it's not necessarily because we didn't want to, it's just because it's not necessarily, we don't have information at that level. So if you've got it, please, please let's work together and, and get that that way. But if the information is available, use it how you need to use it. And and the overlays, the, the various ways, because you can take all the different pieces and overlay them to get to what part you need to get to. So, um, there is that flexibility, but if, if you're not seeing what you need, let's work together and, and get it get it to the way you need it. Yeah, I mean, the one additional thing, I mean, actually the question itself is the local level to map assets and update it locally. Uh, you know, like the, it can be done. We have a tool and then we have process. And what I'm saying is, but it will require some resources. That's what I'm saying. And definitely. And so it may be that, you know, in the in the future, and I don't want to speak for you, Dr. M, but in the future, maybe that we're able to to find additional resources or communities may have their own resources to be able to help do that part. Yeah. So technology wise and all the tool wise is possible. But again, you know, it takes time and some resources. Yeah. And and so Dr. Dr. M, I would like to echo that as well. And I think so one of the feedbacks that we did receive as, as we were emphasizing on the civic engagement or community engagement part of, of our tool is, is, the, is the emphasis on capacity building and technical assistance uh, for communities to use. And that is something that is part of our, of our plans uh, that as we, as we try to launch this more nationally and with other state data, uh, we will be looking at adding more capacity building or technical assistance resources as part of our, uh, not only on the website, but also uh, of future webinars that we'll have in, in, in the works to uh, give uh, real examples of how a community can actually go to the website, look at you know the way their data needs to be formatted, what kind of data they can supply and how they can use it or where do they upload and use it on, on, on the OHNI tool. Um, yeah, again, I agree. Something a result of the feedback uh, that we received from our uh, from our stakeholders in, in Florida and other national groups as well. Yeah, so I guess that, that maybe we can provide another webinar, you know, how to, you know, local level, they can use this data and how they can map the assets and update the data too. We can have like another like session of the webinar, you know. Yes, absolutely. Um, 
So moving to the next question, uh, are the dental resource directory customizable overlay maps uh, printable or have the ability to save the image to post it into a report or website or only accessible on the site? So uh, you can save the image to uh, post it in a report or website. Uh, for the printing question, I'll have Dr. M confirm. Okay. Uh, but certainly you can you can use uh, utilize or or as as pictures uh, for any reports or presentations that you make. But Dr. M, can you answer the question on the uh, the ability? So, to so everything that we develop is the developed based on the interoperability concept. Basically, information and the map can be you know export or like exchange in different platform. So uh, the simple way is actually that a lot of people just do the screenshot and just clip it and print the report. But map can be embedded as part of your website, you know. So in like the as you can, if you see the our oral health need index like the map site, all those map, you know, depending on the where you wanna put it, it can be embedded to your website too. And also all the data is available through the API and also WMS, which means the, you know, the data can be accessed by the you know, third party as long as we give the permission and then they can create their own customized way. So I, I think there's a huge potential, except you know, somebody need to know how to organize and use these resources. So the, at the different level of the users and then you know, application developer, they can access the map. I Great. Just, yeah, I'm done. Thank you so much, Dr. Rim. Uh, so uh, the, the next question that we have, and hope we answer the, the previous one. The next question that we have is, would you work with so, smaller data sets, for example, two counties, uh, size of 23 towns in one state? Uh, absolutely, uh, as, as we have shared it, our intention is to increase access and availability for more granular data but in a meaningful way. So uh, it, as far as our interest in working with uh, regional or looking at identifying or creating more data uh, accessibility at the regional and local level, uh, that's uh, our key objective. So we would love to, to be working and be a resource for those communities and partners. However, uh, from a data question standpoint, it really depends on, uh, on the size of uh, data that we are talking about for the nature of it. So if you are talking about, uh, you know, again, an example of the dental resource directory, if you just want to identify how many practicing dentists are, are there in a certain community and their locations, and if that data is available, uh, there is not a question about the, the statistical significance of that data. However, if there are data about uh, creating more population-based rates, utilizing your data, then the question arises about the efficacy of it, uh, as well as uh, application in terms of the statistical significance of that data. And that's where we are having conversations and discussions around data governance, so that we are not allowing the tool to be used for uh, data that can be misinterpreted easily and, and can in turn uh, negatively impact the conversation. So there is some, some controls on our end, uh, but not to say that we are any which was limited in uh, or restricted in our ability to work with more smaller data sets or even community groups. Um, again, before we move to the next one, I would invite Dr. M, Dr. Houston or Baker to add if, uh, if there is anything uh, to, to my response. No, I think that for me, that was that's fine. I'm seeing a, 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 a response to a previously uh, asked question, though, if I can interject that here um, regarding the uh, what was the name of that organization? The the oral health, the oral health Florida has a data action team, and I see Debbie Foote responded. They are a part of the uh, oral health 2020 network, so um, I'm thinking Debbie is re responding to that uh, comment. Oh. If I'm right. That's great. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, thank you Dr. Houston, for catching that. And uh, of course, and I think so there is another question on OH 2020 network, just a, a, a few more to get to that one. So we may be able to uh, to connect the dots uh, on how this is 
being utilized as a tool for some of the OH 2020 network initiatives and conversations that are um, that are part of the one of the OH 2020 goals is around the measurement system and how we are playing a, an active role in in moving forward uh, with that conversations. But um, I, I I see that there were a couple more questions before the OH 2021. Um, and before I move, uh, Doctor M, did you have any 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 thoughts on the on the previous question regarding the smaller oh. data sets and our ability to work with them? I think you cover well. No, no question. No, we are willing to work with any group. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, what is the web page for the Texas Dental Resource uh, Directory? Uh, again, it's part of the OHNI website. Um, Dr. M, do you want to specifically? I didn't put the link yet, but the, by tomorrow morning, we'll put the Texas one and Georgia one and Tennessee one there. So you can find okay. it from the website. Okay, and it would be housed under the Maps and Data tab on the website? Yes, yes. Okay, so whoever asked this question, for any of the maps that we saw on Texas, Georgia, and Tennessee, those will be live on the website. Uh, pretty soon and you would find it under the maps or the data tab uh, within the OHNI website. And also the intention was again here to show some illustrations and not to kind of build a, a concurrent pilot in Texas or uh, Tennessee or Georgia. Uh, the part of this is part of an exercise that we are trying to see for data availability across the country. Um, so hopefully we answered your question. Um, Moving to the next one, are there plans for demonstrating what the next steps for this tool are in regards to shifting the policies and systems in Florida? A great question. Uh, as long as if if, we are, if this tool is unable to create a change or be a value addition to some systems change efforts in the at the community and state level, uh, it does not hold value. And that's what we that that's really the purpose of today's webinar and giving this opportunity for. Um, audience to tell us what's missing uh, and what we have tried to do as part of this presentation and and some of the the actions that we have been uh, we have been working on 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 our end of planning for the national tool launch is how can we help with storytelling or change making strategies and that is uh, an element that we are looking that apart from capacity building and technical assistance how can we also provide more uh, training or toolkits to uh, to utilize by stakeholders in terms of uh, larger policy and systems change effort that can be come up with like report templates that we can use for ED utilization can we come with report templates for um, just oral health access and its connection to oral health outcomes in the community and and the demographics so uh, there are some ideas however uh, with the data that Florida already has and that we are able to visualize it uh, we would love to continue the engagement with the group and seeing how we may be able to support some of those efforts in, in utilizing that data for uh, for any of your ongoing efforts or future efforts as they are being planned. Um, uh, Ankit, I would like to add to that, that um, when users use this tool and um, demonstrate how the tool is used, they will in also inform us of how the use of this to help shift policies or, or how they used it in regards to um, systems in Florida or any place else that it was used. So I think it's a two way street in terms of the use, the meaningful use of the tool and, and how users did uh, engage the, the data and the information for grant writing, for uh, policy making, for whatever. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and and I think uh, again, uh, the idea is to uh, to again make this uh, as a, as an asset or a resource for our our stakeholders and champions in the community. So if you have stories to to share with us, we would love to hear that, and that's going to further um, refine our strategies and what else do we need to add to make this a, a complete resource uh, for each one of you. So um, great addition, Dr. Houston. Um, mm -hmm. The next question, which is the OH 2020 is, I'm curious now about how you are working with the Oral Health 2020 network you mentioned. Um, so again, uh, I think Dr. Houston needs, uh, will, will have a, 
a much more um, objective based response around the whole strategy but just kind of some insights that we are a part of OH2020 network and uh, this this uh, the idea for this project was really emerged or stemmed from the conversations um, by going back to 2013 and 14 where there was uh, a lot of challenges and we still continue to have that there is not enough data on oral health and especially when you talk about social determinants of health and the connection uh, so we needed something and that stemmed the whole conversation for this initiative to happen uh, since then we have continued to engage with the network uh, one of the which 2020 goals that uh, basically informs the whole network strategy across the uh, across the country uh, focuses on developing a measurement system and Dr. Houston uh, has been a leader on uh, on moving the conversation uh, as far as um, that goal is concerned. And we have had some exciting things in the works since this uh, pilot tool launch. Uh, and that, that we are working more closely with OH2020 partners who have share similar interest in access to oral health data uh, to be able to uh, put a much more coordinated strategic effort. But Dr. Houston, I think so it deserves a response from you as well from a vision setting uh, Endpoint. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. Um, we've been working with, as Anka said, the Oral Health 2020 Network for for years, and um, I'm part of an Anka as well as part of the leadership team um, with the Oral Health 2020 Network. I specifically serve on the uh, health equity uh, work group as well as the data measurement network response team and um, I'm part of the um, policy team that will have a convening in uh, Virginia uh, next month. And so um, we, Dr. M as well as others have attended mostly all of the, in the last several years of the 2020 network meetings. And um, we're just fully engaged in the Oral Health 2020 network. Um, I think, with with almost every committee so um yeah that's my response to that that's great um and um uh, dr Im, do you have um anything to add to this question or the previous question no, no. okay and i think so we we have one more uh that i can see in the list but azam correct me uh, if I'm missing something, but the well, yes, there okay. are two questions left, two questions. Um, but they cover sort of the same topic. Okay, so let me let me let me yeah. take them, and we'll see if we can answer both of them, or we can we can just take it one at a time. So, have you considered presenting Medicaid dental care utilization data at the county or zip code level? Um, and uh, a follow-up question to that was. Will your project be presenting visualizations other than maps or creating dashboards of maps with other visualizations, perhaps like state level tools or comparisons, trend lines, relationship between variables, ranking, zip codes, etc.? Um, pretty exhaustive question, and I'll try to respond this. But I, I think again, Dr. M, Dr. Baker, and and Dr. Houston can uh, add to this. So, to the first part of the question, as far as Medicaid utilization is concerned, uh, the first question is or the struggle that we have is to be able to see if, if that data is actually universally available for all states and is that being collected in the same format and that are some of the exploratory conversations or research that we are conducting right now with different stakeholders and partners to understand the way it is being collected and it can be reported and what is shareable and not shareable in a in a public domain or through a public resource um, but that is an important measure that we want to track and ideally from what we have had the experience so far or the feedback that we have had uh, with other efforts on the data side as well is it, it can be tracked at the county level uh, not necessarily at the zip code level so hopefully that answers the first part of the question and then as far as the second part of the question which is about uh, other ways of visualizing the data than just maps so uh, we we will want to emphasize or keep the focus on maps to be able to uh, keep the geographic element of things uh, in our storytelling 
and and share the difference from the national, state, regional, county, and zip code level. So geography remains the focus, and maps is the best way to illustrate that geographic uh, relationship or geospatial relationships. However, uh, for reports, for presentations, uh, there is a value in uh, in other data visualization tools such as charts or uh, trend charts or pie charts and so on. Uh, based on the type of data that will become the part of the comprehensive framework within the national tool, uh, we may look at some design or tools for charts or graphs and, and so on for different indicators. However, there is not a uniform um, strategy in terms of there will be illustrations available in different designs and formats for every indicator that's out there. Uh, because if it's not going to be effective as a way of communicating that, then we don't want to put it out there. That's our that's our, our background thought. Um, however, I would encourage and invite my, my team members and colleagues to uh, to add to this if uh, if I'm missing something. I, so I, I think about the data and uh, you know the, basically you know we can do all this, but I, I guess the, it depends on the priority and then also resources that we have and how effective it is. So I mean again, like you know things can be done, but uh, we need to you know set the priority with the resource that we have and we can have a plan for the short term and mid term and then long term how to make the effective visualization and then to provide some analytical tool. Definitely. And I think that a, a big part of it not only is what is best presented in which factors, what exactly the particular priorities are. Uh, some of these things are, um, some states already have some different dashboards with some pieces of these things. For example, in the state of Florida, there's Florida charts, which does present some things not necessarily with the same type of overlay or overview um, as the maps we were showing today, which would be fantastic um, if that was able to be done. Um, but I think that that in the future there would be the potential, you know, if you're already able to be to be mapping certain pieces and you can already um, take things and embed them, say, in different websites, there is the flexibility and the ability. We would just have to think about how to do that for as many different um, geographic locations as possible um, in a way that would be useful for people in different regions of the country because, of course, different regions have different priorities um, as well. Not only what this project has, but different regions. Um, but if you have particular types of visualizations that you think would be useful um, because the interactiveness of these particular maps is very dashboard-like um, if you if you take in that consideration. Um, but if you have particular visualizations you would think of, um, particularly I, I come at it again from the epidemiology standpoint, please send them to us and so we can think about them in terms of the priorities that, that can be set. Well said. Thank, thank you, Dr. M and Dr. Baker. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling down my screen here and I, I feel, I think we have covered all the questions that we have received so far. Azam, please correct me if I'm wrong one, or if I'm something. One more question just came in, if you would mind answering. I sent, uh, you sent in right now? Sure. So what about overlay of where water fluoridation is available? So again, a great question. And I think Dr. M just responded to, to that specific one in, in his part of the presentation. So when we were uh, uh, collecting the data to build our tool for the pilot, uh, we wanted to see if we could get the water fluoridation uh, data by the county and it was not consistently available. However, there have been changes since then and there is uh, availability of county level data as far as water fluoridation is concerned from the CDC as a resource and we will be looking at adding that. Um, uh, that's an important preventive measure and uh, a part of the, the storytelling exercise as far as oral health is concerned. So we will we will be adding that variable pretty soon. And, and will definitely be a part of our framework uh, as we move towards the national launch. Well, I believe that's the end of the questions. And um, unless the panel or uh, speakers have anything else to add, I 
believe we can conclude this webinar. Uh, is there anything else that uh, needs to be added at this time? Dr. M? Uh, no, no. Okay. So, and not for me as well, Dr. Dr. Houston, not for me. I just want to uh, re-emphasize uh, our, our gratitude for, the, for all the attendees who were able to attend the session today. And, and those were great questions and just reiterates uh, our focus as part of the OHNI team and what we are pursuing to do as we move forward. So um, a great webinar and an audience for us today. So again, thank you everyone. And no, no further questions or comments, Dr. Houston from me. Okay, fantastic. And, and Dr. Baker, do you have any comments? Um, same as same as Ankit, I think I just wanted to appreciate the the audience that was able to attend. There were a lot of really great questions. As a data person, it's really nice to see other people thinking in the same way of let's um, put a lot of information together um, in various ways. And I think this conversation was really important for the future of of where this is going. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to turn this back over to you, Azom, and thank you so much for hosting us and. Uh, making the recommendation that we do this. Thank you again. Oh, thank you so much for uh, facilitating this great conversation. Um, again, all I'll add is I know a lot of people wanted to ask if the recording would be available, if the slides would be available. We'll send a follow-up to each and every one of you, including those who may not have been able to attend. Um, so this information is available. And of course, uh, feel free to visit the website, oralhealthindex.org. I believe that's the correct website. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.